that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Welcome to the Nick Bryant podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Ross Chite. He is a political science professor at Brown University, and he wrote a book called The Witch Hunt Narrative, Psychology, the Politics, Psychology, and the Sexual Abuse of Children. Glad to have you on the show, Ross. Thanks for having me. So, You went back and you looked at a number of cases that have been labeled uh, the satanic panic, and you showed that there was actually child abuse. And you you spent a lot of time on this book. How many many years? I did. It's it's always a little hard for me to remember or account for exactly when it was going to be a book. Um, But as I think back, I, I spent at least 15 or 16 years researching, and it was more like 18 start to finish from it becoming a book. So it was it was a long project, and it involved at least 100 wonderful Brown undergraduates as research assistants going to far flung courtrooms um, all around the country. So you and I read that, that you had a lot of help from multiple students over those over that 18 year period. And today we're going to discuss the McMartin case. I think the McMartin case is the imaginal line for the witch hunt narrative, which Ross really, really elucidates throughout the book that most of these um, satanic panic um, scandals actually did entail uh, child abuse, even though the child abuse has been lost in in all the uh, frenzy. So, I'll start with a, a pithy um, explanation of the uh, of the McMartin case as it relates to the witch hunt narrative. At the McMartin case's apex, it included 41 child complainants, 14 of whom participated in the preliminary hearing. The remainder of the complainants discontinued the case. The preliminary hearing lasted 18 months and the judge ultimately ruled that seven people who worked at the McMartin Preschool should be indicted on multiple counts of child abuse. But in June of 1984, a new district attorney took over the prosecution and dropped the charges against five of the defendants. Only Ray Bucky and his mother, Peggy Bucky, actually went to trial, and their case involved the child abuse of 11 children. Their trial lasted two years, and they were found not guilty on most of the child abuse charges. But the jury was hung on 12 counts against Ray Bucky. That involved that involved three children. Ray Bucky had a second trial in 1990, and that trial was hung on all counts. Ergo, McMartin entailed no child abuse. But the McMartin case, as it relates to the wish hunt narrative, has numerous problems. And could you tell us a little bit about the first complaint that came forward, uh, Matthew Johnson? Well, what I would say first overall, I mean, is that at one point from your summary, it was it was even more than that. At some point, the, the people were describing the McMartin case as the largest child abuse case in history. So it went from being described as the largest child abuse case in history to nobody being convicted and that's the witch hunt narrative is there was nothing to it um uh, before i even answer that question i just want to be clear about what it took for me to get to the transcripts and answer the questions you're now asking and put together the chapter that's in my book because i had to go to los angeles and i had to go to los angeles multiple times and people who have written about this case have never done this (laughs) 
The people who have written, the people who have made strong statements about this case have never actually read the transcripts. So it's that's kind of what's most remarkable to me. So the case begins with a mother named Judy Johnson um, and her son. And what's remarkable about this is that the details about the son have been completely lost and, and distorted. And they're very simple. The mother is concerned that the son's anus is irritated. And it's clear from medical records that she's had that concern all summer. It's also clear from medical records that when she went, that when they went to the doctor early in the summer, there was no discussion of child abuse. This wasn't a mother bringing up child abuse, looking for child abuse. She wondered if it was pinworms. So at the point that she takes she that she thinks it might be child abuse is in mid I think August 10th or 11th of 1983 when her son says something about Ray Ray and something about um his anus. So she then naturally thinks that something has happened but what's key is that she goes to a doctor she goes to her doctor at Kaiser Permanente, and her doctor at Kaiser Permanente makes observations that are consistent with what Judy Johnson describes. So this is a woman who later will be cast as a hysterical mother. And there's a medical report where a doctor at Kaiser that day verifies, and let me just get you the language. He says, um, significant redness and occasionally some bleeding. He suggests that she go to a second doctor um, and she goes to the second doctor and there's a second medical report. And this is several days later. This is Dr. Scott McGeary. He says that there's a band of redness in the anus um, and that it appears red and roughened. And he suggests that she go to a child abuse specialist. And they go to UCLA a week later and are seen at the Marion Davis Clinic. And that's where Dr. Simpson Savory says that there is um, discolored bruising patterns and that the injury was recent, quote, within the last week, but not in the sense of hours. And, said, and then is reported to the Manhattan Beach Police Department, the victim's anus was forcefully entered several days ago. So that's the origin of the case. The origin of the case is a mother who takes her, her little boy to a doctor, ends up with three medical reports that suspect or verify um, child abuse, ends up in a report to the police. And all of those details have been eliminated by people who just want to cast Judy Johnson as a crazy mother because two years later, she becomes quite isolated, uh, clearly is an alcoholic and, and dies, um, which are facts completely irrelevant to everything that I just told you about the medical reports. Yes, the witch hunt narrative maintains that Judy Johnson was an unstable alcoholic at the time of the allegations and overreacted to her son's complaint and that he was only examined by an intern. Yeah, no, I've even seen the claim that she was a diagnosed schizophrenic at the time. Um, I don't believe she ever was diagnosed as a schizophrenic uh, and the alcoholism clearly was not the case at the time um, because not only are these medical reports re verifying everything that she says, there's at the time there was a Los Angeles Herald Examiner which did a profile in um, and described how strong and healthy she was at that period of time, jogging constantly, eating health food. And she she, um, she was not suffering from any of these things in August of 1983. So after uh, the uh, McMartin is in Manhattan Beach, uh, California. Yes. And ultimately... Uh, her son, Matthew, his uh, accusations trigger the Manhattan uh, Beach Police Department. And they arrest Ray Bucky on nine, uh, on, I think, uh, September, September 7, yeah. 1983. But yeah. he was quickly released. The Manhattan Beach Police Chief then sent out letters to all parents who had children enrolled in McMartin, inquiring if they suspected that their children had been abused. Eight families responded to the letter, 
Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, what's most important is that's not at all how this case gets portrayed by anyone. Every single account you'll ever hear of McMartin says the police sent out this report and then hysteria broke out. And that's exact. That's every account starts with the letter. And then what you think the next thing that happens is the community um, is up in arms, wild accusations are made. And, and many people have acted as if within days of that letter, children are saying all of these crazy things about uh, balloons and Martians and things that we'll get to, none of which happened immediately after the letter. In fact, what's most striking and really shows you how little any of these accounts know about the case is the school did not close down. There was no community outbreak. Many people were unaware of these charges. Most people kept their children in McMartin and there was absolutely no press coverage whatsoever, no public awareness of this case for six months. So what's important about that to me is there's a six month period here where there is some investigation going on, but there's no community knowledge. There's no hysteria. There's nothing like that. And as you then said, eight people answered the sheriff's inquiry. Um, so even though the letter may have been ill-advised or should have been done differently, uh, it did not cause hysteria. It caused eight people who had some credible reason or had some reason to respond to respond. Now, my book is the only place you'll ever find any account of those eight people, partly because they don't end up in the trial and partly because you have to do an incredible amount of research to learn about these people because they're not in the trial. Um, but I ended up locating the log that the police department had and things like that that are the basis for the information about what I call the September responders. Now, I, it's important to say the September responders, there's limited information about them. But the limited information about them in each case is incriminatory and points to Ray Bucky. And in some instances, very clearly points to Ray Bucky. So um, I'm going to leave it to anyone interested in that to read the accounts that I give for each one of those people that are September responders, because um, there's lots of detail. There's also, uh, as, as any honest account of this case would, would have to say, there's ambiguity. Um, the first family to respond to the case, a family that seems very persuasive, um, whose child is videotaped not at CII by Key McFarlane, but at UCLA uh, long before CII ever enters the case. Um, this family is in some ways very persuasive, and they end up dropping out of the case. And there's an account, there's a videotape, but there's transcript that there are two versions of the transcript and the transcription's not that good. And what I'm saying is there's evidence in this case that's not easy to interpret. And anyone who acts like all the evidence is either easy to interpret or is clear hasn't looked at the evidence. So it was uh, Tana Mergilli that you were talking about who was examined by a physician at UCLA. And then Sarah Barton came forward saying that she had been molested by Ray Bucky. Then Sally Gregg came forward saying that she had been molested by Ray Bucky. And then uh, Kathy, Kathy Wilcox, whose child Karen attended McMartin, relayed to the police that Karen, uh, that Ray would take the girls into the bathroom and molest them. And Sally Gregg was one of the girls. Mary Gordon was the next victim to come forward um, who said that she'd been molested by Ray Bucky. And then Kathy Vick, Kathy Ingram came forward and said that she had also been molested by Ray Bucky. And the Manhattan Beach Police Department received three additional responses in, to that September letter in which children had told their parents that they had been molested at McMartin. Consequently, at least eight families whose children attended McMartin came forward with allegations or indications of child sexual abuse. 
you want to comment on that at all? Well, I, I would to the, to the extent that um, you've given all eight of those a kind of similar description. And I think that the, the exact evidence in each one is somewhat different. Take Sally Gregg, for example. Her initial response was to the police, we're leaving town. Uh, preliminary discussions with Sally, she said, quote, Ray Ray does not wear underpants. And then she says, Sally has been overly interested in touching my genitals. So I think that's significant. And in fact, there's a lot ultimately about um, Ray Bucky not wearing underwear and in some way clearly exposing himself to children. And and there's something very creepy about Peggy Bucky saying that she checked Ray Bucky for hard-ons while he was working at the daycare. So the, the notion that she said Ray Ray does not wear underpants, is, I think, is significant. I don't think she said she was molested by Ray. You know, so I'm saying that there's kind of the, these, all eight of these said things of varying levels of specificity and varying levels of um, detail. I mean, that's the same thing. All about Ray. Okay. The parents of the children found that MP. Uh, Manhattan Beach Police Department Detective Jane Hogue was abrasive when questioning the children. So in October of 1983, the Los Angeles District, District Attorney requested the assistance of the Children's Institute International, a Los Angeles-based abuse therapy clinic run by a woman named Keen McFarlane. Do you want to give a, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, CII, Children's Institute International? Yeah. Um, CII, again, the accounts of this case sort of act like every single child went to CII and every allegation was generated at CII. Neither of those things are true. Um, first, it's very significant that there were children interviewed and who made statements that we've just referred to, a couple of whom were videotaped um, before CII. And, and I say this because CII becomes the ultimate, their defense. The defense is that it was, the, the interviews at CII were suggestive, and that's where all of the allegations came from. Um, what I found through a detailed analysis of the CII interviews is quite the opposite. Um, and that is that in November and December, the first two months of CII interviewing, the children are saying very little at all. Um and they're saying almost nothing about anyone other than Ray Bucky. Um, and it's important to say that the children are not being interviewed in any kind of chronological order or any clear, logical, uh, uh, investigative order. They, it might be just by who contacts them, something like that. Um, and and again, the details of this inter, of this investigation don't appear in anyone else's account of the case. Uh, instead, there's just an account that sort of all the interviews looked the same and acted the same. And the scholars like um, uh, James Wood at um, UTEP has done a, an analysis. He's done a sort of computer analysis of 50 interviews in the McMartin case. Um, and what he didn't notice is that in those 50 interviews, the words like helicopter and devil and Satan and all these crazy things that some children eventually are say, but are attributed maybe to all the children, don't appear once. So the, the CII interviews, I think, have been mischaracterized as being the source of the allegations in this case, um, when in fact that's, that's really not true. So the CII interviews started on November 1st, 1983, and Key McFarland yes. interviewed 15 children in November. Yes. But only three became involved in the criminal case, Mary Gordon, Kathy Ingram, and uh, Tricia Walter, who were the 8th, 9th, and 11th interviews. The remainder of the 15 children said nothing incriminating or very little that was incriminating. But Key McFarland concluded that virtually all of the children had been abused, at the end of November, for all intents and purposes, McMartin was, in actuality, a small case. But CI concluded it was a very large case, and the quality of the interviews began to 
de began deteriorating because the CIA staff believed that all of the children interviewed in December were victims of <clears throat> were victims of abuse at McMartin. Well, there is a point uh, that that the thinking is that that even if a child doesn't disclose, they probably were abused. I, I'm not sure if they were thinking that at the moment, but eventually they do say to the uh, Child Protective Service Agency in California that they think there's probable, there's reason to think that every child they interviewed was had been abused. Um, now that, again, charges aren't brought in connection with every child, um, but there is, I think it is fair to say that, it, that they come to think at CII that the children have all been, have been abused. And the medical diagnoses that start occurring, particularly in January, um, are also saying the same thing. And those are over diagnoses. Those are, there's no question in my mind that there are parents being told in January of 1984 that their child who went to McMartin is, was abused there um, when, they, when they weren't. Once the CI staff concluded that all the children had been abused, their questioning tactics changed quite a bit. Um, they would include peer pressure statements like all the other kids said, or Key McFarland told one child that he was a scaredy cat, quote unquote scaredy cat, because he didn't say he was abused. As the quality of the interviews deteriorated and the children said that the, the children, one child said that the preschool had a trap door that opened to a pit of alligators. Now, a core tenet of the witch hunt narrative is that the CI planted memories in all the children. But the CI transcripts reveal that the children who actually went to trial said nothing about the devil, Satan, or ritual abuse. Do you want to comment on that, Ross? Yeah, the, the satanic part of this case um, for some people, that that the whole case is characterized by the craziest things that any child said, um, and then the important question to ask if you're if you're taking the case seriously is: Was that child actually in the case, uh, and what charges were brought in connection with that child? Um, and, and the answer is that the most extreme things that were said by children were never a f part of the case in any official way. Um, but that, but it is true that in the preliminary hearing, uh, there were children that don't end up going into the trial who are saying things that I think I would call fantastic. Um, I would not say that they characterize the entire case. Uh, they certainly don't characterize the origins of the case, nor do they characterize the charges at the actual trial. But the fact that this case became this enormous investigation that then ultimately was charged seven people and then was narrowed back down to two means that there's a lot going on. And, and um, the trial itself is only against two people. And those charges were not in any way satanic. But there were people saying things who think that there was Satanism in this case. Um, and I think those people uh, are wrong. When you talk about a fountainhead of the witch hunt narrative uh, is a book written by um, uh, Debbie Nathan and uh, Michael Snedecker. It's called Satan's Silence, Ritual Abuse and the Making of a Modern American Witch Hunt. And they attack... The, uh, Tanya um, Margali, who was the, the second child to come forward, and they say that uh, that Key McFarland planted the word bad in her mind as it related to Ray Bucky. And actually, she had volunteered the word bad as it related to Ray Bucky. So some of these uh, people that have laid down the witch on narrative that are the foundation of the witch on narrative are actually incorrect in, in many of their premises. Yeah, no, that's a very important, you're right that um, Nathan and Snedeker's book does contain some details about the period that I'm talking about. So I, I think Nathan did understand that Tanya, the first respondent was significant. 
Uh, and and you're right. She's dismissive of Tanya and says that, in fact, Key McFarlane, you know, planted the idea or brought up the idea that um, Ray Bucky was bad. And I got a transcription of the interview and and it's she distorts the chronology of the interview to cite something that said later as if it was uh, said earlier. I mean, it's, it's truly dishonest. And, and what my book documents by page number is when the child actually first says something that uh, uses the word bad and how Nathan then later um, reports it in her book. Uh, let me add something else about Tanya, because uh, Nathan also essentially makes fun of Tanya uh, on on a question where the um, where Key McFarlane says, do you know the difference between the truth and a lie? And this is an important question that kids get asked. Uh, and Tanya says a lie is brown and has a long tail. And Nathan makes fun of her and, and makes, basically says that shows you this child um, was out of touch with reality. Uh, what that in fact shows you is that Nathan has no understanding of children. What that child obviously heard was what's the difference between a truth and a lion? And a lion is brown and has a long tail is a perfectly sensible answer to a child who would who heard the word lion. Uh, it, and in fact, the follow up, since it was an ambiguous answer, uh, there's follow up in the interview to make it clear that she knows that she's saying what the difference between a truth and a lie is and that she thought she heard lion. And again, in the book, Nathan portrays it in a way that makes the child look foolish and is is distortion of the interaction. So it, it's bad faith representation of what happened with Tanya. So the CIA interview is commenced in November and they went through May. But in December, there were no new victims or there were no kids that said that they had, had been abused. But CIA had concluded that Ray Bucky and Peggy Bucky had molested kids. And also um, five teachers at McMartin were involved. So at this point, CIA had obviously jumped the tracks of reality. As the CIA interviews continued through April of 1984, they became increasingly divergent from the initial allegations that were centered on Ray Bucky. The children discussed ritual abuse, pornography, being transported to different locations, et cetera. Would you like to chime in on that, Ross? I just, I'm always nervous at the children because some children said those things like that and some didn't, you know? I mean, the children are so varied in what's said. But, but during this time period, it's absolutely true that now some children are saying things uh, that are highly implausible. Um, and then the question is, are they actually ever part of the case? Uh, and as I've said, for almost all of them, the answer is no. Okay. And then um, in December, the parents of Brianna Chapman came forward, or actually in January, Brianna's parents had been staunch supporters of McMartin, and they didn't remove their child from McMartin despite the allegations of sexual abuse. But Brianna's mother had discovered signs that her daughter had been molested, and her daughter told her that Ray had spit in her face and hurt her. A physician, Dr. Myron Metzenmacher, uh, would conclude that Brianna had been molested. Though Brianna's mother testified at the grand jury, the witch hunt narrative has excluded Brianna's allegation of sexual abuse, perhaps because the defense opted not to call her as a witness. Right. Now, this is a truly striking piece of evidence, and it may be that the other people who have written about this case don't talk about it because they haven't seen the grand jury transcripts, and I have. Um, but the grand jury transcripts were located at, with the transcript in Los Angeles, and, and a serious scholar would find them. But what you've just recounted is is so stunning to me because this is a family that knew there were allegations against Ray Bucky and didn't believe them and so strongly didn't believe them that they kept their child in Ray Bucky's care. Uh, 
um, for all fall and, and were unconcerned and only because of something that their own child said to them in a clear way, did they change on a dime. And they were their own child made such a strong statement to them that was so clear that a family that had dismissed these charges as out of hand took their child to a doctor and her their doctor said I I have this one in front of me the doctor said um, oh they went yeah that there was a remarkable scar that showed stale stages of healing and was between two and four weeks old this might be the strongest child in the entire case. And yet, this is a family that I think was only in the grand jury proceedings. Because again, this case blows up in the public eye um, around this time of the grand jury. This becomes, and we'll talk about how, how what a big deal this becomes, and families drop out. Families don't want to be involved in something that is getting the national spotlight. And this family ends up disappearing. But the evidence at the grand jury is very strong on this family. The uh, medical examinations were conducted by CII, too, and basically two doctors, uh, Dr. Uh, Astrid Heger and Bruce Woodling. And they unequivocally overdiagnosed sexual abuse in the children who attended McMartin. They did, and that, and yet, then that statement gets overstated. So it's uh, this is the complication: is um, Doctor Woodlane ends up talking about something he calls the anal wink, and I think people have that it has been largely or entirely discredited. Um, and there are signs, particularly signs about the um, size of a vaginal opening that are no longer considered um, indicative of abuse and did used to be. But all of that said, and one of the things I do carefully in my book, and it's one of the things that happens at the second trial, is there's a careful consideration of the ways in which the understandings of around pediatric child abuse have evolved and some things like scars in the vagina are still as indicative of abuse today as they were 20 years ago and so the the witch hunt narrative sort of acts like all evidence of abuse in the 80s or 90s is suspect and should be discounted or ignored when in fact there are all kinds of evidence of abuse from that time that still stand up today so basically you're saying that all the medical examinations just shouldn't be discounted because yeah right conducted by doctors i am i am but i'm also saying my god if your own child was misdiagnosed as as abused so you would now be positive your child had been abused the idea that you would then spin narratives that would be consistent with that and you would find you know um, it helps explain the deep end that some parents went off trying to understand a reality that wasn't true, but they had every reason to think it was. And again, we have the uh, witch hunt narrative coming in with uh, Nathan and Sneedecker, and they're talking about the first child, Matthew Johnson, who has come forward. And they say that if Matthew, if they're, they're uh, citing a study by Erickson and mm, yeah. patterns of child molesters. And what they say is that if the things that had been done to Matthew had actually been done to Matthew, he would be quote maimed or killed yeah. because yeah. of that paper. But that paper does not mention maimed or killed at all. So here's another lie that's been woven into the witch hunt narrative that was quite easy to dispel. Yeah, there are several of these. They they do act as if the medical claims in this case are, are somehow outrageous. And yes, that if this was true, he wouldn't have been able to walk. Um, and this is where the scholarship in Nathan's book just doesn't check out. Her own footnotes don't bear out what she claims that that argument isn't even borne out by the source that she cites. So there's a, a very brutal preliminary hearing that lasts 17 or 18 months. And yeah. at the onset of the preliminary hearing, there are 41 children who are complainants. And at its conclusion, there are only 14. After the preliminary hearing, the charges against Virginia Martin and five of the teachers were dropped by Ira, Ira Reiner, who was a new district attorney. But the charges against Ray Bucky and his mother were not dropped. 
Yeah, so that preliminary hearing is quite something. It was an unusual California feature, and it was the longest preliminary hearing in, I think, California history. It lasted way longer than many, many trials would ever last. And the only question in a preliminary hearing was whether there was, a, you know, it was a low threshold. And at that point, we haven't talked a lot about this. I mean, there, the decision was made to charge five teachers um, in addition to Ray Bucky and his mother. Um and so that hearing, all those people had lawyers. And what it meant is that every child on the stand was then cross-examined by seven lawyers. And there were children on the stand for days on end on cross-examination. There's a way in which children were abused in the judicial process in this case. It was it truly was an outrageous way to treat child witnesses. And again, the people who don't believe there was any abuse don't seem to have a problem with that because they think it was all unfair to um, the defendants. But it was whatever you think of the evidence. This case was very unfair to the children. That often occurs where the children are brutalized brutalized story. yeah brutalized they really were brutalized in this case and that's why you know you said it's there were 41 complainants and it ends up with 14 and one of the things that happens is people drop out because there's a family where one of the children i think in tanya's family the older sister has a nervous breakdown there are families that just you know the pressure of being involved in a case that's now national news um, is horrendous um, and people drop out. And, and I want to emphasize this is horrendous for the people, the teachers, too. I mean, um, Nick, you know, people were charged in this case who shouldn't have been charged. And in some way, that's the only story that gets told now. But it's not a false story. Uh, it's just not the full case. And the pro what I ask, I hope poignantly in the book is, why can't we hold two truths in our head? Because there are two truths in this case. And one is there were these teachers should not have been charged. And the other is there was substantial evidence of abuse against Ray Bucky, who was never held accountable. Both of those things are true. With the witch hunt narrative and many other things in the mainstream media, it's either black or it's white. Um, yeah, and you're right. It, they, no you have to have one story, and two stories is too complicated. So that's the story we get here, but it's a story that's disrespectful to the children and ignores all the evidence against Ray Bucky. So the first uh, trial started on July 13th, 1987. The prosecution ultimately went forward with 11 children. And the jurors found the, the most relevant evidence against Roy Bucky and his mother came from Sally Bragg, Tricia Walters, and Allison Brown. Sally testified at the preliminary hearing and the first trial. She was the only September respondent who testified at the first trial. But she wasn't among the initial children who were interviewed by CCI, which interviewed the vast majority of the children. Through the prosecution's expert witnesses who were physicians um, testified about the pictures of Sally Bragg's scars were consistent with sexual abuse. But the defense expert, Dr. David Paul, who had flown in from England, testified that the child had a perfectly normal anus. He had Dr. Paul had unusual methods in his examination of children. For example, he inserted his finger in their vagina as a quote unquote measurement. Now, the witch hunt narrative does not think his examination techniques or Dr. Paul in general um, should be scrutinized at all. And could you talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Paul? Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that the the critics of this case have heaped scorn on Dr. Astrid Hager um, and have ignored Dr. David Paul. Um, and, and Dr. Paul was the expert for the defense. And first, it should be said that Dr. Paul thinks some of the children in this case were abused. Um, that's one thing that's been lost is that he actually acknowledges some of this evidence is was strong. Um, but he's a suspect 
expert. Um, and, and I think that's clear um, uh, uh, through the cross-examination and his own notion of inserting his finger into the person he's examining um, is downright abusive uh, and is not something that is in any way medically credible. And if Dr. Hager was doing that uh, or um, or, um, uh, uh, or the anal wink uh, doctor, uh, you would be hearing all about it. And instead, there's just an you know, there's a people will cite uh, Dr. Paul criticizing things in McMartin, but there's no uh, no recognition that he was not a credible medical um, child abuse expert. So the CII physicians, uh, Drs. Hager and Woodley, reported that Tricia uh, Walters had several incarcerations of the hymen that had been that had become scars but there were no pictures to back up her testimony. Dr. Paul would concede that if the testimony of Dr. Hager, Drs. Hager and Woodley was truthful, the lacerations were in fact indicative of abuse, which you had just said. Right. He agrees that that lacerations are not something that are now discredited. And he is saying that, well, if what they are reporting is true, this child was abused. And there's a couple children where he actually says, well, this and I think a couple, there's some question about the statute of limitations. But uh, he does not contest all of the evidence in this case. And one of the sloppiest things that the people who cr criticize this case um, do is they just reject all of the medical evidence. And again, that's easy easy to do because some of it should be discredited, um, but some of it should not. And anyone who's taking this case seriously should try to understand the difference between those two. A child that appeared in both trials was uh, Allison Brown. And she was interviewed by CII in March of 1984. And she suffered from recurrent nightmares that someone was breaking into the house at night and her father actually nailed her bedroom window shut to ameliorate her anxiety. A Allison had uh, scarring on uh, her vulva and Dr. Hager testified to a medical, quote unquote, to a medical certainty that the scarring was not self-inflicted. Dr. Paul testified that he could not discern scarring. The witch hunt narrative categorically accepts Dr. Paul's testimony. Yeah, there. I, Dr. Paul just said a few things that seem indefensible, and I think that there's some point where they sh where they show him something from a textbook that he doesn't recognize what it he doesn't recognize what it actually is. He's just not a highly credible um, expert. But what's important in mentioning these three girls is you don't get to a second trial unless there's a hung jury in the first trial. If you're acquitted, you don't get tried again. Uh, and there was a hung jury in the first trial. And there's a hung jury in the second trial. And we're in a system that's set up so that it's better that 10 guilty go free, right, than that one innocent be convicted. Um, and, and so the rules are stacked in a way that it's very hard to convict people. But the fact that you have hung juries in both trials shows you that jurors in both trials thought beyond reasonable doubt that there was guilt. And jurors in both trials thought that. Well, some of the medical evidence was flimsy, but there was medical evidence that would be germane today. Uh, which yes, means yes. And, and what they did in the retrial was focus on the th on three girls, all of whom had strong medical evidence. Um, and it was, again, a hung jury, and it was a much, uh, they didn't try as hard, I think, in that second trial. It was very abbreviated. The prosecutors showed that they didn't know the case very well. But again, the jury was hung. And, and at the post- um, post-verdict press conference in the first trial, most of the jurors went to a press conference where they said, we think children were abused here. We're just not sure beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and, and that's how our system is set up. But then the narrative should be how hard it is to convict child abusers, not something about how bad children are as witnesses. Well, the witch hunt narrative denies that any of the medical evidence indicates signs of abuse. Yeah even though five of the September respondents showed signs of sexual abuse before CII and 
the way that all the medical evidence has been discounted is uh, is truly egregious in this case. Yeah, there's a lot of medical evidence in this case. And what you find are critics generally boil that down to one or two sentences that either say it's contested um, and it's complicated. And I had, I ultimately had an undergraduate spend a year going through this medical evidence with a pediatrician to try to understand. And this was with testimony from the second trial where they're going through how me how medical knowledge evolved in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and what's clear is that there was both misdiagnosis at the beginning of this case, but the second trial allowed this opportunity to actually ask, how strong is this medical evidence? And so the very questions that are being raised by people critical of this case and the evidence were addressed in the second case, and I think convincingly show that there was strong evidence on all three of those girls. So the first trial commences in uh, January of 1990, and the, the verdict is actually the, the the trial for Ray Bucky and his mother Peggy went that went for a couple of years, and in yeah. January of 1990, the jury delivered its verdict. The jury voted to acquit Ray Bucky and his mother on 52 charges. The jury could not reach a verdict on 12 counts against Ray Bucky and a conspiracy charge against his mother. And as you said, at the press conference, seven jurors said that they believed sexual abuse had occurred at McMartin, but the CIA tapes planted seeds of doubt. So there was a second trial that started on May 7th, 1990, that focused primarily on Ray Bucky. And he was retried on uh, six of the 12 counts in which the jury could not defeat, re reach a definitive conclusion in the first trial. Just beneath the exterior of the witch hunt narrative is the fact that Ray Bucky is a strange and troubled man. Mm. He had previously garnered complaints of lewd and lascivious behavior because he had exposed himself in public. Trisha Walter's mother said she had seen kids sitting on Ray Bucky's lap as he was reading a Playboy. Could you comment a little bit about uh, Ray Bucky? Yeah, right. And you know that first one that exposed in public, he had been, he had been hanging out and maybe volunteering with a young girl's soccer team, and there were complaints about him not wearing underwear and clearly being exposing his genitals. And this is, there's a thread of this with him. I, I think it's clear from a number of things that this guy did that. And I think he did it at the daycare. Um, and his mother ends up saying in the first trial, when confronted with, you know, he was reading Playboy magazine with children on his lap. And she says something like, well, a lot of men read Playboy magazine. And so the mothers kind of suspect, too. And the conspiracy charge basically is saying the mother had at least suspicions, if not evidence of abuse and covered up for him. And I think it's really clear that she covered up for him. Uh, they dropped that charge, but the jury was hung on that charge because there was certainly evidence that the, mo the mother said such weird things um, that it seemed like she had knowledge. Um, and the exposing himself, there's a, there's multiple pieces of evidence of that. Um, at the very least, he was intent clearly doing that. And there's an article in the Los Angeles Times that has become woven into the witch hunt narrative that reported that Ray Bucky couldn't have molested the children he was accused of because he was working at McMartin Preschool, because he wasn't working at the McMartin mm. Preschool when many of the molestations occurred. However, the prosecutors had extensive evidence that placed Ray Bucky at the preschool during the molestations. The witch hunt narrative, as it's related by Nathan and Snedecker, maintains that Ray Bucky took the job at McMartin, McMartin because he was attempting to figure out his future. Yeah, he was a troubled kid who should never have been working at the daycare. Um, and, and where this most likely happened and where the strongest evidence is, the kids who were there between two and four in the afternoon when he was the most, where he maybe was the only person taking care of kids or the main person, but he was there in the later afternoon hours, not as a preschool teacher, but as someone taking care of children. And he should never have been entrusted with children. 
And then we also had a problem with the uh, prosecution. The first uh, prosecutor for the case was named Glenn Stevens. And uh, he had failed the children in a number of ways. Actually, the uh, Los Angeles district, district attorney had failed the uh, children in a number of ways. It did not supervise the uh, CII process. Um, it had made charges without considering all of the evidence. And then politics trumped professionalism. Yeah, the the prosecution did a terrible job in this case, and and the they. If I go back to that early timeline, what happens is no one's aware of this case, and then it gets broken uh, on a local TV show, where that that's doing nightly stories in February of 1984 about the mass molestations occurring at McMart that had occurred at McMartin, and no one's been charged. Now, this is unheard of in today's age. You would never be running stories with names and specifics before there were any charges. Um, a lawyer wouldn't let you do that. Um, but they were doing it nightly, and it put intense pressure to bring charges. And I think the L.A. County District Attorney rushed this enormously. They charged the case based on log books of those videotapes. They didn't watch the videotapes themselves. And so the log books have these very vague descriptors that are really supposed to just point you to where the child's talking. They used those as if those were statements of fact. And so they overcharged the case. Um, they didn't investigate. They should have watched these tapes before they did the charging. Um and I think the original DA thought he was riding the largest child abuse case in history and that that was going to be a great thing. Um, and then Ira Reiner uh, realizes that it's overcharged and he drops charges, the, and appropriately so, uh, against the teachers. But, you know, the, the district attorney did not handle this case well at all. The district attorney, the first prosecutor, is, as I said, was Glenn Stevens. Oh, right. Glenn Stevens. Oh, yeah. Can I say something about Glenn Stevens? Yeah, right. sure. So Glenn yeah. Stevens leaves the case and becomes very important because he becomes very credible to the witch hunt narrative because he leaves the prosecution and he ends up co cooperating with the um, Abbey man who makes a movie called Indictment. And he ends up acting like he's his view is the entire case was based on nothing but i have in my possession the hundred plus page memo that he wrote when he left the da's office and it's very critical of the charges against the teachers and it says very very clearly that he thinks ray bucky's guilty so he has just moved away from that position because it doesn't make for a good movie but the fact is, he's now lying about what he thought when he left the DA's office. He thought at the time, and he put in a long memo, that he thought Ray Bucky was guilty. Well, this is where it gets a little mind-boggling with Glenn Stevens. So he's working with... I am being Myra Mann. Myra Ma and Ma yeah. Manns, to, yeah. uh, and, and they're writing the movie Indictment, which will star James Wood and categorically yes. agree yep. with the witch hunt narrative. And he becomes good friends with the Mans. And uh, although Stevens thought Ray Bucky was guilty, he toasted the acquittal of all the defendants with the screenwriters, with the Mans, um, which is kind of bizarre, actually. Well, it's clear, and I document this in the book because I have the transcripts of the tapes of the conversations he had with the Mans over a period of two months. And it's clear that at, when he tells them that he thinks Ray Bucky's guilty, the Mans say to him, well, that's not a very good story. And when he tells them that Judy Johnson was not crazy, they tell him that doesn't make a very good story either. And it's clear by two months later, he understands that saying those things is going to make a much stronger movie. And so he starts saying those things. But it's clear that he didn't originally think them. So I think he's he's as corrupt as they come. So after the, uh, the hung jury in the second trial against Ray Bucky, um, the media trumpeted the McMartin trials and uh, and the acquittals. And it had become almost a national obsession, the, the McMartin trial. And unfortunately, the plight of the children who were molested by Ray Bucky has been granted zero ontology. So they well, were... that, 
the, you know, you take a case that had been called the largest child abuse case in American history and no one is um, convicted. You wonder what happened and what what the narrative that immediately occurred in the L.A. Times was and it won a Pulitzer Prize. It said the problem in this case was no one lit a match within a mile of the prosecutor's foot. And that's true. In the early phases of the case, that's true. There was not a lot of skepticism uh, expressed to the prosecutors. But here's what's true ever since. Ever since, those very same journalists have, have neglected to light a match within a mile of any defense lawyer's foot. And Michael Snedeker, by the way, is a defense lawyer. So the Nathan Snedeker book is co-authored by a defense lawyer and a defense lawyer who represented some of the people in this book and in this, and, and a defense lawyer who would be commit malpractice if they said anything that went in against the interests of their own clients. So he's duty bound to make an argument in favor of his own client. The idea that a defense lawyer's word would be taken as a, as a historic account of a case is just absurd to me. So we have all these children molested by Ray Bucky, who we will never will never know how many, but I'm sure that he molested a number of these children. And unfortunately, the witch hunt narrative will spare them no quarter. According to the witch hunt narrative, they have not been molested. How troublesome is that? That these children have been molested and the rest of society believes that they haven't. Well, uh, it's very troublesome in the in the particular, but it's more troublesome that the case then stands for this idea that it's either easy to convince children to say things that aren't true, um, and, and it's really not that easy to do, um, and that the case does you know that the case doesn't stand for the things that people think it does. It stands for some of those things and some things that contradict it. It's a very complicated story.